All right. So welcome um, to ECCF's Coffee and Conversations. Um, appreciate you taking the time today to be here and um, learn a little bit about what's happening with the impact of our digital equity initiative. So for those of you who I haven't met, I'm Beth Francis. I'm the president and CEO here at ECCF. Um, and we do these coffee and conversations like two to three times a year around our impact areas. And really what it's designed for is um, casual, have your coffee, learn virtually with us um, around understanding and learning um, what we're learning about the, um, in this case, our digital equity initiative. Um, we like to share the progress that we've had to date in, in the work that we've been doing. And we also want to like lift up some opportunity for you to hear some on the ground nonprofits that are actually doing the work with the investments of our digital equity um, initiative. So that's a little bit about like what Coffee and Conversation is. Today we're focused on digital equity. Um, and then we're also um, uh, a group of diverse people here in the Zoom room today. So we actually have donors. We have some public officials that are with us today. We certainly have those that are engaged with us around our digital equity work. Um, nonprofits are going to hear from one today as well, but we have others in the room as well. Um, and we also have our board and our and many of our fund advisors here in the room. So, and many of you play different roles. So it's a good eclectic group of friends, um, but all of you certainly care about the work that we do. And most of you here in the room are either engaged in the digital equity work or you're a donor to the work that we do. Um, I also want to just take a second to tell you what the next hour and hour and a half will be together. So we're going to talk just high level ECCF's digital equity initiative at a glance. Um, many of you have been along with us for the ride for the last three years. Um, and so um, we don't want to be redundant, but we just want to kind of set the table for everyone. Um, we're going to talk about our current investments in digital equity and where those have been made and the kind of um, numbers of folks that have been impacted by that. And then we're gonna talk about what sustainability for this looks like, because we're a little more than halfway through our four year initiative. Um, and we're already thinking about what the sustainability is and what our end game is in this work. And then we'll do some wrap up um, and Q and A for our speaker for ECCF around digital equity. And for those that wanna stay any extra time um, I have about four or five um, updates from ECCF that I'm happy to give you. All of you are very close to the organization, so we want to give you some heads up on some things that are coming along. Anybody needs to fall off whenever you need to fall off. It's This is a casual thing, so don't feel free to, to go ahead and do that. All right, before we get started, I wanted to just um, take the, the, the time, the important time, to thank our partners the, the corporate partners that you see on our left are all of the annual corporate, um, uh, we call them cor corporate partners, corporate supporters, who actually power all the staffing and all the operations that do our impact work. And so we want to give them a shout out and say thank you. There's a couple of you here on the call. You'll see your logos there. I also equally want to thank, we've had over 50 donors give to digital equity. So the $3 million that has been raised and deploy, and, and we're in the process of deploying in our community um, equates to those 50 plus donors. And I don't have everyone's permission to share names, so I won't, um, but I just, we can't do this work without all the partners at the table. And these are really important and you know who you are. So thank you for being here today. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Stratton to kind of set the table. Terrific. Thanks, Beth. And um, as Beth said, this is this is meant for you all. Um, so uh, we're going to try to we're going to try to keep it moving. But if you have questions or concerns or thoughts, you know, please raise your hands, um, interrupt or, you know, feel free to put something in the chat and we'll monitor the chat also. And if uh, if any questions pop up, we'll make sure we jump there. But really, the intention of this is to really uh, keep you all current. So uh, Please use it, uh, and if there's anything confusing, please please ask questions. Um, the other thing is, you know, on this, you know, on today's call, as Beth said, you know, uh, this great group that we have, we have folks with a lot of different um, sort of understanding of what we are with doing in digital equity, and and so 
Um, we have some folks that have been with us since the beginning and, and have heard a lot of this um, stuff before, and then some fo folks that are newer to it. So as a result of that, I wanted to give a little bit of context um, before we jump into some of the, the very specific stuff that we're doing in our uh, digital equity initiative um, as sort of how we got here. And so uh, as, as many of you all know, um, ECCF um, is committed to a, a focus on community leadership really driven by um, a, you know, an, 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 a goal to inspire collaboration to tackle the biggest issues across our region. And this is what we call systems philanthropy or our systems change efforts. And we've done this now in multiple different areas, which are multi-million, multi-year efforts to tackle the biggest issues in our region. And, and, and this was highlighted in our Columbia gas work that we did in 2018, small business resiliency work, workforce development work, and then our great partnership with the Bar, Bar Foundation in Arts and Culture. Um, and so similar to that, you know, sort of that, that commitment towards collaborative systems work, um, when COVID hit, um, you know, back in 2020, uh, we pulled together a group of leaders, many of you all were on that call, um, of about 70 plus leaders of mayors, state representatives, nonprofit leaders, uh, community college leaders, um, et cetera, et cetera, to really ask the question of, you know, what has changed with COVID and what should we be thinking about due to the impact of COVID? And what was interesting is that the number one topic that came out of there was the digital divide. And the digital divide was ubiquitous. Um, and folks were seeing it obviously in education, but we were seeing it in healthcare, uh, in workforce development, in uh, employment issues, in uh, elderly, you know, issues. Um, need for vaccinations, need for COVID tests. It was just ubiquitous. And, and obviously for all of us who've lived through COVID, we, we know that now. Um, but the question was, you know, what do we know about how we are doing as a county around the digital divide? And so this um, sort of the, the call to action for the community foundation from that learning was to work with Tufts and to do a study to say, how are we doing as a county? What are the baseline issues? You know, how are we doing across the 34 towns and cities and what are the big constraints and barriers that we're seeing as we talk about digital equity? And so this is really where we started from. And from that work, um, from the data study, uh, from nearly 200 conversations with nonprofits, government officials, for-profits, uh, some of you are on the call today, uh, we designed a strategy focused on the core barriers of digital equity. We can go to the next slide. You driving that, Beth? Um, I'm trying. It's not you're going. Trying, I know. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> I could see your mouth moving with your mute on um, as you curse your screen or whatever. Um, you know, uh, totally get that. But you know, so we designed a strategy. You know, really focused on the core barriers. So all of our work through data gathering is to really understand the ecosystem. And then through understanding the ecosystem of the digital divide and digital equity, we can identify where are the biggest barriers in that ecosystem. And so in this case, what we identified, the primary barriers were around uh, access, uh, access to affordable internet um, uh, devices, the need for actual devices, uh, literacy, uh, so for many folks, uh, they actually didn't even have the capability to, you know, create an email account, uh, to navigate a browser, to have some of the basic literacy. Uh, a lot of that was language based, but also just, you know, um, if you're uh, culturally not not uh, used to the Internet, it may be more difficult. And or if you're at a different age, you may not have grown up with the Internet. Um, so those were the core barriers that we identified and, and some remarkable data that came out of that, like 35 percent of folks in Lawrence, as an example, didn't have affordable access to the internet. 35%, I mean, it just blows your mind when you think about that. One in five families didn't have a, a device for their family, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, being spoiled, you know, my children have many devices. I have many devices, you know, and so how do you operate in today's world without a device um, in your family? So these were the core barriers. And then uh, consistent with our, our strategy of how we do it, we then design interventions uh, underneath those barriers that are countywide focused uh, with an equity lens on the populations that can most benefit from that investment, but interventions that we call levers of change. But these are areas where we feel like with a relatively small amount of money, we can have the most leverage to reduce those barriers for the individuals um, in those communities that can most benefit 
from that investment. And so that's that's sort of our methodology and how we got here around those barriers and then the levers of change and the, the interventions that you'll hear more about coming up from Kate um, in a second. And we set a goal uh, within that work uh, to raise about $3 million uh, to commit for four years um, to do this work. Um, that was sort of the initial sort of investment and uh, scope and the initial time scope that we we decided to do this work and really to focus on connecting individuals, providing devices and training individuals across the community. And then also building a coalition of about 200 plus leaders across the county that can work together to, as a community of practice to not only uh, share learnings uh, and grow together, but also be able to access additional resources and additional funding that the community before couldn't benefit from and well beyond what we as a community foundation can deliver. So again, through that collaboration and building trust, we can also see if we can um, you know, uh, have other leverage across the community. So that was sort of the, the vision and the strategy and how we got here. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Kate, who's gonna talk a little bit about our phase one work uh, that we've accomplished um, in the first couple of years, and then what we're thinking about in the next couple of years um, as we continue this multi-year effort. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Stratton. Uh, <clears throat> it is so great and energizing on this Friday morning to be amongst all the people fueling this work. Um, we've all been along on this journey together. So um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for your support. As you all remember, we have launched um, in phase one and two of this work and just a review of what we have accomplished together. We're going to look at this visually in a second, but um, <clears throat> We created the first uh, regional digital literacy effort in Massachusetts and one of the few uh, on the Eastern Seaboard, which we're really excited about. We started that with five sites and you're gonna see how much it's grown and how exciting that is. Incubated and launched um, a device e-recycler with the Tech Collaborative, um, enabled 30 plus uh, access sites all across the county uh, in various different ways, right? We did traditional um, community-based centers, and then we also thought outside the box alongside our partners on the ground to stand up centers like homeless shelters, like food pantries. Um, and it was really, really exciting and, um, and revolutionary, and also stood up the first regionally-based uh, neighborhood the Point neighborhood. And we'll look at that with the see what that looks like in action and establish our robust coalition. Um, so let's see what that looks like in action now. We're going to just um, bring up this and you're going to see a visual of this, but we're going to go through this interactively um, for a second here. Hold, please. And while, while Beth does that, and thank you, Beth. I got it. That. I got it. There we go, Kate. So amazing. Let's start with access, Beth. So this is Essex County. Um, the shading here on the map from a transparency standpoint, we really wanted to show where the investment was going. As you all recall, we launched this with that data study that Stratton was talking about back in 2020 and then refreshed that over time. So if you overlay that, if you overlay that study with this, it shows exactly where the investments needed to go. And the darker the shading, the more the investment has happened in that space. And which again is consistent with our data as, as we do all systems change efforts data driven. Um, and you can toggle through this and play with this at any time. This is a living organic map, which is really exciting. These are our access centers. And um, <clears throat> if you look here, you can see as Beth is, is moving over them, um, the various different points, whether they're community center based or whether in further southern down the county, they are, and in Lawrence, with Lawrence Community Works, they are neighborhood based, right? This is really, really exciting stuff. We had the, um, the, the wherewithal and vision from the community to say, all right, we need a varying different forms of solutions here for Essex County. So we need those community center based Wi-Fi's, right, which was a traditional way that you would access the internet prior to COVID, right? If you needed something, you went to a community space. Um, and we did that and we saw the value in that. But because of COVID and also because of the inequity of that, really started to look outside the box, right? With systems change efforts allowed us to do, to say, what if we did a neighborhood, right? And so we have the Point neighborhood in Salem and then um, a neighborhood that is up and coming in Lawrence as well. So really, really exciting. So then Beth, if you don't mind clicking on the coalition, this map take access down or just add coalition? No, you can just, let's, let's build it. Okay. Yeah, 
That's awesome. So thank you. Coalition here doesn't show individual members, but rather large groups of, of members of our coalition all across the county. We are over 200 members now. And as you recall, we had that goal at the beginning to say, you know what, if we could get 100 people together over three to four year life of this, that would be a really huge effort. And now we are way over 200 um, with an exciting, robust, active coalition, which is really, really exciting. On the equipment side, um, so we started with... Uh, the incubation link just told you about there at the tech collaborative there in Amesbury that Beth is pointing to. Um, <clears throat> and then this map now shows where all those devices have gone. Um, we are in the process of actually our refresh. So you'll see that there are, uh, there are going to be lots of additions to this in numbers, but we have now done 6,000 devices. As you recall um, from Stratton's conversation, our goal over those three to four years was 5,000 devices. Now we hope to do five, four to 5,000 a year. Um, so that just shows you the scale and the power of the impact of of what your dollar means right what can what can do what can happen inside of incubator inside of a systems effort so it's really really exciting and then finally on digital literacy i painted that picture for you all we imagine those five sites around the county where we started um, and these green dots are literacy sites um now and um Oh, no, I'm sorry. Those are the coalition. The purple, purple dots. Thank you. The purple dots, yeah. purple dots. Thank you very much. A Friday morning. Uh, and the purple dots show that now we are we are nearing 30, 30 literacy sites across the county and growing. Um, really, really exciting. And that um, goes with our Techos Home program that we've been partnered with in the beginning, but also um, homegrown. Uh, literacy efforts that are happening at the local level, like at the Lawrence Public Library, like at Make It Haverhill, that are workforce driven, right? That are meeting the needs of that neighborhood, which is incredibly powerful, um, incredibly powerful. So you can see there just what the impact of the work is so far in growing. Just as a reminder, you can get to this map by visiting our website, going to our work and impact. If you go to our work, you'll see all of those areas of focus that Stratton talked about, but digital equity right there on that homepage, there's a link to say view digital map and it will bring you to this page. All right, let, can I take it down now, Kate? Yes, please. Okay. And, and I dropped it in the chat too, just FYI. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. And um, as we do that and toggle back and forth, what is really exciting about this map is it's living, right? You can see those investments growing, uh, which is really exciting over time. And then I think um, we can go to the next one, Beth, when you're ready. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. So we, uh, we, you know, met those needs, those individual needs, those community-based needs that were all driven by our ecosystem, by the coalition, uh, to stand up those access centers, to start taking um, uh, and testing risk, right? So let's try a literacy program and let's try a device refurbishment program. And as you can see, that really has gained a lot of steam. And as we started the phase two of the project, we started looking at the collaborative partnership grants, which is very typical to what we do uh, in uh, in systems change at ECCF, because we want to see that collaboration, want to build that muscle on the ground. Um, and we launched um, partnership grants to inspire that thinking and that collaboration, experimentation, and really important sustainability and scalability of your local muscle on the ground. Um, we completed, it'll be completed in one year. We did this over the summer and launched these in September. Um, did about between 250 and 300K uh, across five to six projects. And then we'll, let's take a look at what those are because um, we want to really bring you on this journey with you because this is a really inf inflection point in the project, right? We were able to meet those needs. We built the muscle. We established the coalition, right? We're building ourselves up. And now we're going to specialize in the individual needs of our organizations and our neighborhoods all across the county, right? So you can see here, this is a lot on here. So I want to call out a couple of things is the partnership piece on that third column, you can see each one of these proposals has an incredibly robust partnership list, um, which is systems change by city, by town, um, throughout the region, which is really, really exciting. We're already seeing the benefits of that um, across the uh, across the um, the projects and the project area. So I want to call this out because I think it's really important for us to all step back and acknowledge that there were populations, right, that we would love to serve, whether we knew we needed to serve them or not, right? Um, reading program for families. At the beginning, when we launched this project, did we know that we could use digital equity to do that in the future? Um, 
probably hadn't contemplated that yet, right? Because as the system grew and as the ecosystem was getting larger, the opportunity was getting more. And now as a society, you know, pre-COVID versus now, very dependent on this virtual space and this virtual world, it's being integrated into all sorts of different aspects of our lives. Um, workforce development and um, for Healing Abuse, Working for Change for Hawk, we have Sarah with us today. We're going to hear from her directly. Um, a really exciting project um, with a very, uh, very high need there. So I will leave that for her to, to give us more information about. But in the North Shore CDC, um, we're looking at ESOL, Workforce and Education. As you all remember, we built that residential-based Wi-Fi system in that neighborhood, put our literacy in there. You, we also, uh, you know, influx 500 devices into that neighborhood. You can see now how systems change is working right in that neighborhood. And it's super exciting. Now adding on a workforce education and an ESOL um, component to it. This really meeting the needs there. And then finally, um, for our, um, you know, housing insecure, new arrival populations, new laws that were passed in Massachusetts, really being able to use our partnerships to see how digital equity then plays a role in that space. So it's incredibly exciting. I spent more time on this than um, than I would normally because you all have been on this journey with us. And I think it's really important to celebrate the the influx and the change over uh, of the projects. Um, and then we can go into the next one, Beth, please, um, which would really love to welcome Sarah Stanley, um, the Executive Director of Healing Abuse Working for Change. Um, she's been an incredible partner alongside um, her colleagues at Hawk um, with ECCF for a long time, and we're excited to try this new project with her. So welcome, Sarah. Um, we Good have, morning, everybody. We're going to allow you to share. You, we already have everything in here for you, so Beth can, um, can do that when you wish. So welcome, Sarah. It's good to see you. Great. Thanks so much, Kate. Thanks, Stratton, Beth. Um, it's great to be with you uh, this morning. Um, I'm so thrilled to be partnering um, on this project. This is making a huge difference for people who are experiencing domestic violence. Um, so if um, I'll give, yeah, thank you, um, Beth. Um, so what we learned during the pandemic is what everyone learned, right? Um, our world has changed and where Hawk has traditionally provided really impactful services like access to um, help in court to apply for a restraining order or uh, free legal advice on how to get divorce or ch child support, we realized we were falling short on helping people, not with things like food or clothing, but for a new basic need in our day and age, which was access to computers and internet service. Um, when we joined this program in just four months, we've had 85 people enrolled, which has been fantastic. Um, so now that we see that we can meet this, this new basic need, um, thanks to this partnership, um, we have been able to give devices, a mobile hotspot in 12 months of free internet service. Um, and the most, this impacts individuals' lives, but it's impacting us as an organization. We are based um, directly adjacent to um, the Point neighborhood here in Salem, and we serve 23 cities and towns across the North Shore. For us as an organization, all the time and energy that we used to spend helping someone get to a safe computer um, can now be reallocated to other programming that is gonna be of higher impact. Um, so when you think about how, do, you know, how we access the internet, we need a safe computer first and foremost. When someone is in a domestic violence situation, monitoring and tracking via devices is one of the primary tools someone might use to control someone. Having access to a safe and secure device is a game changer for someone. Um, for us as an organization, we no longer have to work to uh, help someone take a bus or an Uber or find the time to go to the public library or to our office, for example, to use a computer that isn't being monitored or tracked. Um, maybe if we want to just go to the next slide. Thanks. 
Are you, do you see the one that has the icon? That's the last slide I have, Sarah. Is that not the last? Yes, slide? that's perfect. Okay, all right. Perfect. Um, so safety, this has been a game changer for us. Um, next um, is that we know that this, this program is successful because it acknowledges the reality that when someone is ending uh, an abusive relationship, they're normally needing to relocate one to three times during the first year. And of course that varies, but frequently someone might need to spend a few nights in a hotel or maybe they're staying with a friend or family member, then possibly a shelter stay and working their way to more permanent housing. By creating this program to acknowledge that reality that folks need, a mo need mobile access, that is making this successful. Because what we wanna do is make sure that your dollars are being used effectively. If we gave someone um, access um, and service that was tied to one location, um, within a few months, it might become obsolete and a waste of money. So this um, program design acknowledges the reality and makes the investment worthwhile and impactful. And so when we think about access to internet and a, and a laptop, it's it's, a lot of times about cutting down the time needed to go physically to different places and make phone calls. Some of us might be of the age where we remember fondly, you know, going into the bank in person or maybe talking to someone at your doctor's office in person. We, we appreciate those in-person interactions. But in general, the world has changed. We know that we're no longer staffed that way. And in reality, if you are reliant on those kind of in-person um, services, you're going to wait longer. Um, so what we might see, especially for a single mother um, who's working full-time, who just left an abusive relationship or trying to leave an abusive relationship, that means calling her doctor's office day after day, trying to get her mammogram results. But with her own laptop, she can just hop on her patient portal and get her results. Instead of going to finding the time on her lunch break to go to the bank, she can pay her bills online and manage her finances online in a safe and secure way where her passwords can be changed and, and secured. Um, likewise, just the, the littlest things of running to the store um, to buy your kiddo a new pair of uh, shoes. When you can order those online and have them delivered, that saves time. And what might feel like uh, little conveniences to us make a huge difference when you put them cumulatively together for someone who is working to catch up and stabilize after experiencing an abuse, abusive relationship. And I would love to tell you a little bit about one of our first clients um, to sign up for this program. Um, she had just... Um, left. I'm going to stop sharing for one second so that we can spotlight you for your story. So just oh, to thanks, that. Beth. nothing went wrong. Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this was one of our first participants to enroll in the program. She was very excited. She had been um, staying with a relative who didn't have internet access. She didn't have her own laptop. Um, she did have a job um, and she but that meant she had really kind of finite time to try to make it into our office to use a computer um, or likewise, a you know, other public um, place like a public library. So, you know, she's trying to squeeze in an hour here, an hour there, in addition to being a single mom at, and working full time. At night, she would sit and stress. She knew her job wasn't paying her enough to make it on her own. Um, and that's when anxiety would kick in. She would hear those things that her ex used to say to her. You're not smart enough. Uh, you're not going to be able to make it on your own. You're going to have to come crawling back. And she started having a bit of a downward spiral um, after the initial adrenaline, adrenaline of leaving. And when we were able to sign her up for this program, Suddenly, she had all those hours after she put her daughter, she finished work, made the dinner, did the dishes, put her daughter to bed. Then she had those hours. 
where normally she'd be consumed by anxiety, she could work on updating her resume, doing her job search, and within just a few months, she secured a better paying job as a lab technician. And this is totally changing the game. Now we're in a positive upward spiral for her as an individual with each success. She's becoming more confident that she can make it on her own. Um, and she's modeling that success and confidence for her daughter. Um, and what we see, you know, cumulatively as, you know, we're invested in our full community, right? I don't care just about helping people, you know, who are experiencing domestic violence. I want to see us all thrive. We know we do that together. And um, what we see is that when some people are safer at home, they're not experiencing domestic violence, we see also a positive impact on all those other issues that we care a lot about, housing insecurity, food insecurity, kids' ability to learn and engage in education. All of those things are connected. So by investing in this, this particular group of folks that are kind of having compounding issues, um, we can really help them, uh, help our entire community thrive. Um, and what I, I love about this program is that it's helping us um, execute on a transformational leverage point. Digital equity is one of the most impactful investments we can make in empowering people to st stabilize and thrive. This is helping us um, as we work with other key partnerships, such as an organization called More Than a Phone, where it will help us secure smartphones and cell service, another key tool for today's world. And you know, we, we know, you know the old adage, you give a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach him to a fish and he eats for a lifetime. Um, what this program demonstrates is that, is that a laptop and internet service is the literal fishing pole in many cases. And so we're seeing as a philanthropic community that if we invest in the right places, we can help people thrive instead of continuing to support um, things that are Band-Aids. And I would love to um, answer any questions anyone has about our program. We have a couple minutes if, if folks wanted to um, ask any questions specifically about um, Hawk's uh, investment and the work that they're doing. If you do unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question, um, we'll also have time at the end as well. Anyone? Our well, while folks are thinking, I'm if Beth, is there someone that's asking the question? Because I can always ask a question while folks are thinking. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kate. Um, and then <clears throat> see if anybody else has anything. I think just making people um, visualize this, Sarah, uh, of what this looks like for, for a family, right? Because if they were, um, if they're leaving a home where there could have been fixed broadband, right? And they might be moving, right, to a different spot. What does that hotspot, and thank you Verizon for your support on that, what does that hotspot mean? They can they can hide it. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Right, right. So we think about um, the mobility and flexibility offered by a laptop and a mobile hotspot. Um, laptop can be kept in someone's purse, maybe the trunk of your car, maybe it's stashed at work. Um, your mobile hotspot, you don't not you don't need to be in your house or one set address to use it. Likewise, that can go with you to whichever location you are at, um, which is really important when people are actively trying to leave a controlling environment. Like I said, monitoring your digital use is a really um, commonplace um, tactic. And to have that safe, secure mobile access really opens up how someone can access all the help and support that is out there. There's one question, um, Sarah, from Kathleen. How curious how much training on technology clients need? Maybe you can describe that a little bit. Sure. Um, just like I'm guessing um, the range of people on this call, it varies for everyone, right? We might have some people that don't need any training, but then we work, definitely work with some populations of folks 
that, you know, perhaps there's a language barrier um, and, you, you know, just physically getting your devices set up is a challenge. Um, and some people might come from a culture or a lack of resources where they really do not know how to use this technology. And there is a, a great deal of digital literacy and training that needs to happen. So the fact that this um, whole initiative bakes that in um, is really helpful. Um, John Payson, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Beth, uh, and thank you, Sarah. It is a great story indeed. And now that ECCF has done the systems uh, philanthropy work to get this program started, I'm wondering what are the uh, limiting factors, if any, for Hawk, or asked a different way, three years from now, how many Hawk clients will be engaged and uh, how is it going to be funded and sustained? Uh, the you know the power of it is and the leverage that you get from it's pretty profound. But uh, now we got to figure out how to get it to the next level, right? Yeah, I think part of it is going to be um, having this pilot and having the data and the narratives to say this is where we should be investing for some philanthropists and and foundations who are maybe still thinking about you know other maybe more traditional forms of support, um, this will give us the information and data we need to say, you know what, we don't need um, funding as much for um, food and, and transportation if you help us invest, which is sometimes seen as a higher investment, an investment in digital access um, that will help folks become stabilized and financially independent um, and advance economically more than some of these other traditional supports. I so like we're kind that. of going to bring other people along um, to where yeah. you all are leading in the front of this, this initiative. Um, we're hoping to bring other um, supporters along. Just uh, one quick follow-on question. I think it might even get a little bit to one of the questions in the, uh, in the chat is, so in essence, we're co-investors, right? At, at a certain point, uh, ECCF gets it started, you get access to it, the system works, and then there's a certain amount of uh, money and effort and internal administrative support that you need to provide and a certain amount of continuous support that ECCF through its program is providing. Do you have a sense uh, what it costs uh, Hawk um, or uh, to provide the administrative support and maybe the ongoing uh, digital access or whatever for the uh, your clients? Yeah, so um, like most pilots, that administrative cost is front-loaded. So working together with ECCF, um, Tech Collaborative, Verizon, to get the process in place, that was kind of the real heavy list lift where the, you know, the, we would not have had the capacity to do this on our own. You know, Hawk wouldn't have been able to engage with Verizon to say, hey, um, let's figure out a way to bill 150 accounts on a monthly basis. Like we just wouldn't have had the, the internal capacity. But with the investment to build that those relationships, you know, we will see um, a, a reduction in those administrative like costs, um, both, you know, hours and, and hard costs. I think Sarah, the, just you. saying real quickly too, you know, Sarah said a few things that, that jumped out to me and we, we mentioned this concept of collaborative grants, collaborative partnership grants, and uh, we didn't necessarily explain what those are, but really the idea of those are to, um, you know, inspire collaboration at the local level, which then empowers organizations like Hawk and Sarah to then build partnerships with partners that maybe they wouldn't have worked with before um, and really to co-create solutions that allow them to innovate. And so Sarah mentioned that before, like, you know, this pilot and experiment and test and innovate with the aspiration to, as you know, to John's question, to build success, which then enables, you know, Hawk to be able to grow that part of their organization in a in a sort of a transformational practice changing way, you know, where, you know, to do that six or eight months ago, like how how is Hawk gonna do that? They have so many other things on their plate and so many other funding needs how are they going to find time to do something that maybe gets to more of a root cause of one of the challenges? So it's, 
you know, I, you know, the way you've articulated that, Sarah, has been super helpful. I think just to see that and see the value of this. And these things are risky too. You know, I mean, we don't we don't know how these. Gonna be a lot of learning. You know, Hawks gonna learn a ton. We're gonna learn a ton. The partners will learn a ton, and that'll make it stronger. Hopefully, to be able to sustain it. You know, um, uh, ongoing. And I love the idea, Sarah, that you're already talking to other organizations like around, you know, Home for Phone or, you know, other other groups that are now probably seeing you as an innovator in digital um, solutions in domestic violence and saying, hey, well, that's interesting. I didn't know you have that competency. Now now we use other other doorways open up, which maybe won't wouldn't have opened up in the past. And so and, and as a coalition, we'll continue to look for those doorways to find other ways to sort of open those up because there are a lot of other things. So, um, you know, uh, you know, opportunities that we never even would have seen may start to open up, but it, I think it just, it's, it's, it just sort of highlights the power of these sort of collaborative grants that co-created with the community um, to inspire innovation. And so it's awesome to see, and, and it's a lot of work. I mean, to John's point around, you know, the work, it's a lot of work from leadership and from organizations to do this. And so we're super thankful to folks like Sarah and Hawk that, you know, see this and are um, innovative to say, all right, this is important to our mission and to us do it. And we're willing to roll up our sleeves and work with you to do this. So we'll just say thank you um, for all of your work to do that. And we're, and, you know, we're humbled to be able to be a participant in this uh, with you all. Thank you, thank you all. Thanks. Stacy's going to yep. come up next. Um, I think you can just go to the next slide, Beth, if it's possible, that's fine. But I, it's, you know, really this moment of um, doing what we just did, which was just to pause for a second and really think about what Sarah just shared. And thank you, Sarah, for all of that. You touched on every single aspect of what systems change, what this digital equity work is supposed to be covering, right? We learned a very um, specific story about an individual person. We learned about how this kind of investment and in thinking about the broader picture brings new partnerships and new leverage points and ripple effects beyond, as Kate mentioned, what we would ever have even thought of was really gonna be the ultimate impact when we first started this work. Um, and I think it's important that we do just pause and think about um, really at, at the end of the day, what we're striving for, and then then come back up to this kind of messy uh, image here that we, I'll say, borrowed from the Skull Foundation. Like inspiration happens everywhere, right? Because we, there are so many moving pieces and parts and systems change in and of itself is an iterative process, right? Like this is where we are, we are right now as a community foundation, what you're seeing on the slide, will be different what, from what school is working on, you know, five years from now. But you see very clearly that there's kind of two different sides of this particular puzzle. There's the doers, there's the hawks, there's the Sarahs, there's all those people on the ground. And there's the donors. And it, the donor piece is not, you know, a little piece at the beginning that just starts off. It's actually a continually building iterative part of the system as well. And that it's absolutely essential to facilitate the kind of commitment and work that this takes. As, as Stratton just said, as Kate has said, we're learning, we're taking risks, we're doing pilots. Like systems change donors are a special breed because you're willing to sort of come along with us to be that sense of risk capital, to bring that piece of the puzzle to the table that allows us to go and innovate, to change, to, um, to learn as we grow. I wanna just even specifically think about um, you know, I'm going to call about, call out one of our partners here on the table, just because I think sometimes we think philanthropically, we think money, which is certainly an important piece of this. But as we've learned, especially in this particular system around digital equity, um, that sort of sustainability within the supply chain side of some of these systems. So I, I'm going to look at my friend Rebecca here, who represents AMG, who is, you know, a really big company located in Essex County. And we went to them and said, how can we partner? They're very curious about our digital equity work. And she said, you know, I have like a like quarterly, an entire closet full of computers that we're constantly cycling in and out. Could that be helpful? 
The answer is yes, of course that could be helpful. And that's not just now a one-time thing that AMG has done and sort of wiped their hands and said, yay for us, but we're building the system of how we create um, you know, a supply chain that we can rely on to tech collaborative that can then supply Hawk, that can do all these things. So we see how all these pieces work together. And I just wanna recognize all of you as a piece of, a really important piece of that system as the donors who come along with us, not just one time, but ongoing, um, that makes all of this um, really possible. So um, thank you and keep it up. How about that? That was a keep it up mess message. Yeah, I love um, it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's well said, Stacey. Thanks for doing that. And uh, and so, you know, we, we talked about sort of how we got here. We talked about phase one. We talked about phase two, which is really focused on these local regional collaboratives um, and, you know, building that local muscle. Um, and so a couple of things coming up um, just to sort of let people know as we continue this journey, we're obviously working on all those local collaboratives right now. Kate's deeply involved with all of those. It's a lot of co-creation that happens. But um, other things that are coming very tactically, um, we have a coalition meeting, which will be on April 2nd, um, just around the corner, which we meet quarterly. Um, and, and these are uh, every single meeting slightly different depending on what the coalition wants. But a lot of times we have uh, resources or funders that come and speak or uh, state programs or partners highlighting work that they're doing um, and also small breakouts for folks to be interactive and to learn from each other um, as a community of practice. And, and um, uh, that coalition continues to be a dynamic place and we learn a ton every single time at those coalition meetings. And so if anyone wants to attend that, please reach out to us and let us know. Um, a lot of you may be already on that list, um, but uh, we, we're always looking for folks and it's super inclusive and it's virtual. So it's uh, very easy to jump on. Um, we have a, uh, a digital equity innovation challenge. Um, this will be our third one um, in partnership with UMass Lowell iHub and, and E4All in, um, uh, up in uh, Merrimack Valley. And that'll be May 2nd. Um, and basically what this is, is a, a challenge run uh, by the iHub to inspire uh, digital equity solutions, grassroots digital equity solutions um, to be uh, to be you know created and then to be offered and winners you know you know people apply for them. There's a judging process, there's a panel, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and winners of that get uh, special um, entrepreneurship support from E for All, um, other support from the Innovation Hub at UMass Lowell, and then some money to actually fund that initial uh, pilot of the project. Um, to do that work. And what's really exciting about this is not only that, you know, it's grown and grown each year now that we're in our third year, but a lot of these ideas that have come in, both winners and folks that weren't winners, um, have gone on now to be bigger projects and to become larger pilots like what Sarah's doing at Hawk, um, you know, these bigger collaborative projects that are happening in different parts of the, of the, the county. So um, they become sort of a seed of sort of inspiration to get people thinking and then can grow into something bigger over time. We also will be doing a second round of these partnership grants, um, you know, replicating what we've done uh, in the first round um, and looking for other partnerships um, in the fall of 2024. So you'll hear more about that um, and continuing to help our current partners, uh, but also looking to inspire that local collaboration in other ways. And then the final thing that I'll just say is that the part of this systems change work, and, and, and many of you all have seen the systems work in other areas, like I said before, arts and culture, workforce development, small business resiliency, uh, COVID and gas disaster crisis management. One of the biggest challenges for us as a community foundation being quite candid is, is uh, you know, what is our role in, in over the long term? How do we build some of that sustainability and that foundation to enable the community to own the work after us um, so that it doesn't need to be funded by us forever? And so as we create any one of these big systems initiatives, if we launch these, we start with the mindset of how do we build sustainability into the programming so that um, we can slowly um, you know, uh, unfold our commitment over time and also be able to focus on perhaps a newer uh, area that might be a higher priority for the community now as a community shifts. And as a community foundation, we're agile enough to be able to take on new initiatives based on what the community needs. Um, and that, that was highlighted obviously with the gas disaster and COVID, but ongoing, what are those big needs uh, with our limited capacity that we can be able to do that. So ongoing sustainability and planning and implementation is something we're always doing. And then in the final couple of years of an initiative, 
we really go deep and focus on that. And so I'll share maybe the next slide. I'll talk a little bit about sort of how, what this looks like, sustainability could, could look like. This is in process. So I don't want to, I don't want anyone to think this is all done, but it's in process, but to sort of articulate a little bit how sustainability looks like um, in the digital equity initiative specifically. And then, and then Stacy can talk about the impacts of that at a macro level and a countywide level as we think about the role of the community foundation. But at the micro level, you know, um, we've talked about some of the things that we've done and, you know, things like these access sites. Um, so putting up the upfront investment to enable, um, you know, or bringing in partners um, uh, that can help enable those access, access, uh, access sites to be invested in, to be created. Uh, as Sarah said, a lot of this is upfront investment. It's building the capacity in-house. It's building the technology investment that's upfront required. Um, and it's also developing some of the programming that can benefit from those access sites. Um, we will continue to sort of, you know, build those out and nurture those. But that is something that we see can become operational within a lot of these organizations once that initial investment over multiple years um, is more uh, stabilized and ready to be taken on by those organizations. And so as an example, in, in even the, uh, the, um, the El Punto uh, you know, community where we've been uh, partnering with North Shore CDC to do uh, a residential mesh network, you know, a lot of that work was designed with the, the question of, well, how does the North Shore CDC sustain this? So if we put in this money to make this investment and create the mesh network and do the digital literacy and provide some of the, the programming, how do they sustain it? And that's something the North Shore CDC from the front has said, we will be able to absorb this operationally through a variety of different mechanisms and knowing that in three, four years, we will need to do that. We can start the planning now and they'll be able to absorb that ongoing. So that's an example in access how that then gets sustained beyond that really upfront investment, which is the most substantial part of that work. Um, similarly with devices, we've talked about, uh, you know, incubating and launching now uh, Tech Collaborative, which is its own 501c3 now um, and has its own team and executive director. And we are even continuing to support them, not only in the initial business planning and 501c3 and initial partnerships and getting them up and running operationally, but now even helping them as they think about fundraising ongoing so that they can be independent on their own fundraising um, to do that work, both fundraising from delivering devices where they can have some recurring revenue and then also fundraising philanthropically uh, to be able to sustain that. So that's where we're focusing with them over the next year or two so that they can be independent and to be an ongoing resource, as Kate said earlier, of delivering 4,000 devices a year. So again, we're, we're doing the work with them with the intention of them being independent and sustaining beyond us. The coalition uh, we've talked a lot about, and then literacy, um, you know, just to finish that off, uh, as we talked about uh, the 30 plus sites that will now have integrated digital literacy into their programming. And, you know, what, what you see is that for a lot of organizations, like we saw in the conversation with Hawk, is that to make that transformational shift, is a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work to integrate digital equity into a homeless shelter or digital equity into, um, you know, a workforce development program. You know, to actually go ahead and, you know, develop the curriculum, invest in the programming, pilot it, test it, build the local capacity, prove it out. That's a lot of work to do that. And so our role really is to provide that, that upfront investment to help them build that capacity so that they can enable that practice change where digital equity and literacy or, or competency becomes part of their overall program and part of their overall mission um, that they're doing so that they can then sustain that ongoing. And so each of these different digital literacy programs and sites that we're doing is a multi-year investment into those organizations to enable them to make that practice change over time and to give them time to figure out how to sustain those operationally and have that become part of the core operation. That's the vision for that. Um, now, obviously, that may not work for everybody, um, but that is sort of the, the work that we're doing with them and to enable that work over time so that it can be um, a higher likelihood anyway of sustainability over time. So that's sort of from a high level what we're thinking about in sustainability and we'll continue over the next um, couple of years to continue to work um, with those different micro areas to do that. So I'm not going to bury the lead here. I'm going to just sort of very quickly go to the end of that slide and just say the aim of all of this, right? While while those 
um, programmatic outputs are incredibly important, right? And show progress towards the ultimate result. What we're really driving for here is resilient communities, right? That's the goal of these systems change efforts. And, you know, it is, um, you know, the mark of success and sustainability for digital equity in particular will come as ECCF steps further and further away from that doer role that we saw on that slide, um, because digital equity itself has become embedded into these communities and the community of Essex County as a whole. And so as we're thinking about, you know, sustainability, we're thinking about how is that really achieved? What's our role in achieving it? And how do we know that we're making um, progress towards those more intangible results that are happening sort of behind the scenes? So there's a few markers that we look at and we want to share um, how we're progressing towards those things as well. So the first is, you know, really this concept of resources and practices. And we've talked about this a couple of times. Stratton just did, and then Sarah highlighted it through John's, you know, really astute question that, you know, simply $3 million over a three to four year period isn't enough to just create digital equity as it exists across the entire county. But what it can do and what it has done is increase the capacity of nonprofits so that they can innovate, so that they can collaborate, so that they can pilot, that they now have the ability to um, understand and serve communities in a way that they know how to do it. Um, that they know how to do it best. And so the the grantee partners that we've worked with, like Hawk and beyond, um, through these pilot programs has led to um, six more than $6 million of additional funding um, into the community. That's come from phil philanthropy, that's come from state and federal funding. Um, and you know that means that these programs are here to stay. This is becoming embedded, as Sarah said, as a part of the key point of these um, organizations and it, it and it's an essential piece of their mission, right? Like again, it's not the sense of nice to have. Um, at the municipal level, we're actually seeing cities and towns creating digital equity plans that which has never been in place before. Um, and by the end of 2024, there will likely be between six and eight of those plans that exist within municipalities within Essex County because people are understanding the, the impacts of digital equity go you know, from the social to the economic and then it's important to roll into the work um, at that level of planning. Um, as Kate said, and as Stratton has you know, continued to bring up, this, this sense of relationships is, in, is incredibly important, that this system is actually made up of the dynamic relationships that exist between the people within it. And these types of long lasting and healthy relationships take time and they take concerted effort. Um, you know, before any dollar was ever committed to any grant making, this countywide coalition was built as the backbone, knowing that it would be the backbone ongoing. And so, you know, as Kate mentioned, these 200 plus strong coalition has continued to learn from each other. They've been partnering, they've been sharing, um, and they're relying upon each other to not just, um, you know, we, we, Think about systems change and we think about this work to like tackle challenges but the other side of that is they can recognize opportunities to work together in a way that may have not existed before um the other piece that we look at is this sense of leverage for us as a community foundation so our role as the as eccf ongoing is really about leveraging our position as a, a trusted local institution on behalf of the whole county so to create this kind of long-term change, you know, we begin by pulling the levers that we can access, the funding levers, the work on the ground. But we also must begin to pull the le levers on the state and the federal level where funding decisions are made and policies are made that impact this work in the long term. So we spend a lot of time working um, with our government officials, keeping them informed of the needs and also the work that could be done and how much more could be done with resources. Um, Kate and Stratton, some of you may know this, actually testified twice to the Broadband Commission um, in the Massachusetts State Legislature. Um, and then we hosted that same commission to visit um, one of our partners in Haverhill, Make It Haverhill, so that we're really, again, embedding this deep understanding with the people who are making some decisions. You know, and there, there also isn't another initiative in the state, and Kate, I'll look to you, maybe even in the country, as we like to say, um, that is thinking systemically about how to address digital equity across a county. Um, and it's getting noticed. So our close partnership, as some of you may know, with the Mass Broadband Institute, um, 
has actually influenced and inspired their now statewide model. The way that they are gonna be working to distribute their funding in digital equity is really built upon the work that we've been doing with them now for a couple of years. And that's gonna be ultimately um, responsible for deploying millions of dollars um, out into the community. And then, you know, the, this mental model, this, this sort of undercurrent that we can all feel that we know really for change to happen in the long term, that we really have to start thinking about the mindset or the changing of the mindset of how we think as a community. And it was right around this time of year, uh, four years ago, when John Payson told all of us at ECCF that we needed to have a plan to be able to work from home for months and months and months. And we were like, John, come on, that's not real. Well, John, you are right. And we all know, um, you know, this sense in that moment of, um, you know, having access to the internet, being able to live in a digital world went very quickly to a nice to have to an absolute sense of survival. And so, you know, solving this university challenge would require, re require resources. We know that. But it's also required like this groundswell of agreement um, that the ability to participate in the digital world is not a privilege, but it's a right. And that is where, um, you know, people start to, we see this as becoming top priorities in our, in our communities. Um, it's the linchpin. This kind of mindset is the switch is the linchpin and making sure that this work can continue um, over and over. And you all are really a part of that, of making sure that that's embedded in all of the ways that you are um, working within your own communities. So I think, you know, as we move forward, it's important to recognize that, you know, sustainability and work like this is not so much a destination as it is a state of being. Um, you know, when the pieces of the system continue to grow and iterate and move together, that system becomes sustainable in the way that it lives ongoing. Um, and that's how we reach this level of community resiliency um, with these relationships that are trusted, these collaborations with philanthropy that is willing to be a partner in the ongoing, you know, communities can look to the future in a different way together so that when we see something like climate change, right, climate transition or the next, you know, big challenge or big opportunity, we're starting from a place of strength. We have the muscle to really employ in that moment um, to start to move forward in a way where, um, you know, we can see those communities thrive overall. Way to end it there, Stacey. Uh, <laughs> um, I am going to stop sharing. Um, we have we have a couple minutes for some Q&A and then um, we just have some ECCF updates. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, any questions from our friends, uh, particularly for Sarah or for ECF around digital equity? So one area I saw a lot of digital inequity, um, I'm a family physician and I practice in different locations throughout the county, is a lot of my elderly patients could not get on the patient gateway. And there's a fair amount of patients not on patient gateway. And it hadn't occurred to me how many patients I just didn't see because they didn't know how to use the technology. Um, all the sites I worked handled this very differently. There were different ways for patients to see me on video, um, but I'm wondering if that's been looked into, if we know how many patients aren't on the gateway and if that's something, especially with the geriatric population that's been, you know, if we have another, unfortunately, if we have another pandemic or a problem, have we, you know, worked on a way to maybe help those, that population as well? Kate, do you want to talk about the Navigator yes. program we funded? Thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, <clears throat> We funded a uh, navigator, telehealth navigator program at the Lynn Community Health Center, the North Shore Community Health Center, um, that has has finished its um, its time period and now inspired a statewide um, investment from the state coming into our community health centers to fund that. So you should be seeing that coming shortly. So yes, at the community health center standpoint funding the the switch from the telephone version to the video version for reimbursements um, is a really important thing for elders in particular. Um, we uh, collaborated with Elder Affairs, with the Department of Elder Affairs, to work with our senior centers to get the Lynn Senior Center as well as Salem to have a <clears throat> to have a investment made by Elder Affairs for training, literacy training. We set up all their devices, gave them a computer lab, um, teach them how to do telehealth, 
teach them, um, also give them individuals within the, com the community center and senior center that can answer questions for them. So navigators built into their system. Um, we're also started, have launched that in Haverhill now as well. Um, <clears throat> and that is, um, it, that's in its first couple of months there. So it's really, really exciting. But yes, there's now going to be a big focus on that population because um, I think at the beginning when we launched the literacy program, our partners at Techos Home and others were like, let's do let's do the population that we're that we're good at right let's do adults let's figure out how to get this out quickly and then let's figure out let's do some pilots to figure out how to do seniors how to do these other populations what do they need what type of device um what type of intervention we learn right they need they need a smaller learning environment they they need navigators that can sit there alongside of them we need to work with our physicians in in our our centers to be able to make sure they're trained on their telehealth initiatives um, to give empowering based in that community. So that is underway. We look forward to any kind of um, input that you may have or that other may have to, to continue that moving forward. And we'd like to see all of our senior centers being to do that um, and all of our um, community health centers as well. Great, that's that's excellent, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing, Aaron. Um, it's great to see you, by the way. Um, and um, it's amazing to think that I saw a statistic at one point when we were doing this work. I think it's like over 60% of uh, Latinos over the age 60, you know, weren't using the internet. So 60%, you know, so, you know, and then we started talking to the hospitals, initially the health centers, uh, Lynn Community Health and North Shore Community Health. Uh, and when we started talking to them, they we said, well, what's your protocol for, you know, identifying if folks are digital literate or not. And they said, well, when people come in, we ask them to fill out a, a checklist, you know? And so, was, you know, you start to think like, well, well, maybe you're missing a whole group of people that aren't even coming in because they don't even know how to access it or aren't, you know, don't know how to get in it, et cetera. And so the whole point of these navigators was to go out into the community, work with community-based organizations um, to speak the, the languages that were appropriate um, and to identify where the barriers were. Um, for these individuals? Is it literacy? Is it access? Is it devices? Um, and then develop, you know, solutions to get all of those folks who aren't even participating in healthcare to be able to participate in the healthcare. So your, your point is dead on, which is who am I not seeing? You know, who is not not coming in because of the way that, that the processes that we're working. And so, I um, mean, then Kate's also done an amazing job working with the Council of Aging's um, and, and senior centers across the whole county now. Um, and partnering with a lot of our in our major urban areas uh, with those with those different um, uh, councils to uh, provide digital literacy in a larger partnership at a statewide level. Um, and so again, that's where we're accessing funding outside of that three million that we've raised to you know uh, be able to fund a lot of this digital literacy at the, all councils of aging. And that's become now like a a primary initiative for the state due to some of the work that that Kate's been leading up and and doing that work. And so. Um, yeah, that's certainly a really important group, both elderly and healthcare specifically. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Aaron. Um, Mr. Payson? One quick one, because I have the impression that we're done uh, funding this at ECCF. So I'm assuming you don't need any more money from donors, or let me put the question the other way around. Uh, how much more do you need and what for? Um, we are uh, so we've raised a little over three million. We have plans to deploy that three million in the next year, year and a half to finish to finish that. As Stratton talked about, what's next in in the next phase for us? Um, we are also to Stratton's point talking about sustainability with our partners and what that will take. Um, but we're always we always welcome more fundraising. Um, so if donors care specifically about this work. Um, we we welcome any additional um, funds that people want to put towards this. Our intention, like in our other systems work that we've done, is that in the next two years or so, and, and our, we always think that our systems change work is going to be three years, three or four years. It ends up being five, maybe an extra six quietly because we continue to fund some of the stuff quietly um, as things sunset. But that is our goal, that this will eventually sunset. Um, but we could we could use for every dollar that's given, it goes right back into grant making, right? Which is what the point is. So we can still continue to accept resources um, into the digital equity fund at ECCF. 
that drives this work. Um, but there is an intention in the next two years um, to sunset that as we lift up, many of you have been at our, our Climate Think Lab, right? As we lift up what the next systems change um, position might be. We're really spending a lot of time as Stratton and Kate talked about, really in the municipal um, and government um, advocacy work because let's face it, government funding can a hundred times outpace what philanthropy can do, right? So um, we're looking at that as a huge sustainability piece, which is why Kate spends so much time with MBI, the Mass Broadband Institute, because it's not as our philanthropic dollars phase down, we're trying to increase that opportunity for our county nonprofits to, um, to access those other funds. And, and we have a $250 million endowment goal. And so you can divert your money to that if you don't whoa, want to. Whoa, 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 whoa. Back it up. Back it also, up. Also sounds like a great area for impact investing. I know you're going to talk about yeah. that. No, we're going to talk about that next. Um, to John, 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 you had too much John, coffee this morning, I think. I'm not sure what. To John's point, for those of you who have not heard, um, we, you know, we raise just to, for those of you that might be new to this concept with us, we raise money for digital equity, right? These donors care about the outcomes we're trying to achieve for, achieve for digital equity. But, and then we're doing it for arts and culture and we're doing it for empowering economic opportunity and we're doing it for, right, all of these things. Um, what we need at the Community Foundation is an endowed, unrestricted, meaning our discretion, fund pool of resources so that we can feed these kinds of things moving forward and stop having to raise um, all of this one time, one time, even though one time is five years, one time, one time, one time. And so you'll hear more about that coming up is that we have an endowment um, that we're um, looking to launch uh, and you'll hear more about that. But to John's point, we would have resources every year to be able to say, all right, we're going to continue to fund the access piece for this, right? And here are some dedicated $100,000 for our 20 grantees that are doing access work. And we're going to continue to fund that with that pool of resources that is also a pool of resources that can fund other things. Um, okay, I'm going to switch gears for a quick minute and just share my screen again. And I'll quickly, because I realize we are starting to go over time. A um, couple of updates. So for, can you see? You can see that slide, right? Yeah. Uh, I got a thumbs up. Um, so CEO search. So you all know um, that we are in it to win it for the next um, CEO here at ECCF. Um, I wanted to make sure um, it's on our website under employment. It's also been going out widely um, to our key stakeholders, which all of you should have received. And then it'll be in the foundation focus that goes out. Kelly, is it going out today or it's going out Monday? Um, but there's links in our foundation focus that we have a position description written now. Um, Koya Partner is our consultant that is doing the recruiting and the hiring process along with our CEO search committee. Um, and so it's public now. It is out there. Um, we could use any and all help to help us um, spread the word about what that position description is. Maybe we can pop it in the chat, Kelly, someone, um, with a link to our website page, at least, that has the, the link on there. Um, so any help that you can give us to promote um, the, the process, you know, can so help us source candidates would be great. Um, I'm often asked, I am in it to win it at, along with ECCF. Um, I'm here until June 30th. I'm not going anywhere. I um, want to make sure that, you know, we we hire, we select and hire and onboard um, the CEO um, that will take the Community Foundation for the next five to 10 years. So um, Institute for Trustees, just as a reminder, we've got record numbers um, this we are doing this. Con we continue to do this virtually because it was it's such a success. We have we are on the pathway to um, exceeding our 1,100 um, registrants for it. Um, again, this year we do it in partnership with three other community foundations in the state of Massachusetts. Um, this is the very first year since COVID that we are doing an in-person kickoff. 
So for those of you who remember IFT for us, it's it's our event, it used to be at Pingree. It was a full Saturday. It was 20 workshops. It was a keynote speaker. When we went to virtual, we lost that camaraderie. So we have March 20th is a kickoff event at Pingree with our a live keynote. Um, Marquise Victor from Elevated Thought will be our keynote speaker. And it'll be at Pingree. And there'll be cocktails and hors d'oeuvres after that event. Our sister community foundations are streaming our live event at events that they're hosting um, in other parts of the state. So if you haven't registered, you are a board member. This is just a reminder. This is a board member, board leader um, and workshop series. Um, it'll run eight weeks of virtual online learning. Um, wanted to tell you about place-based impact investing. Um, so one of the things that we've been exploring quietly, or maybe not so quietly, um, is um, the Community Foundation is trying to figure out what our role might be in place-based impact investing, using capital assets for investments that are re recyclable and returnable investments in our community that come back to us, but do social good for the nonprofit who needs access to that capital. And it's, it may not just be for our community foundation, but for investors in the community. We've done a large exploration um, process. We are spending the next 18 months in an educate, connect, and invest strategy. And we have some, you'll be getting invitations. You'll, um, we are doing, we are focusing on a housing strategy or an opportunity to learn along with us in housing and in um, arts and culture. Um, and, um, and then a whole nonprofit piece as well to help educate um, around that. Shad, do you wanna take a minute to talk about anything I might've missed on that? No, I think I think you got it. I mean, I think it's uh, you know, as a community foundation, we've explored what our role should be in inspiring uh, more place-based impact investing across the county. And you know, our vision would be like, how awesome would it be if there was more capital available for nonprofits to achieve their mission beyond grant money or in complementing grant money? Um, and so we've been we've been exploring that. And our initial role, as Beth talked about, was really focused on educate and connect. And what that means is we're going to create a series of educational events um, that uh, you all will be invited to, uh, investors and nonprofits, to really co-learn with us um, what this means uh, for you as an individual or a foundation or um, a, a fund holder, um, as well as what does it mean for a nonprofit? What, how do they use capital in different ways that they may not be aware of? Um, and um, then from that learning and work together, we'll continue to hone our strategy and determine what our role as a community foundation is as an investor too, and potentially creating um, opportunities for folks to participate in, in vetted investment opportunities in targeted areas that, that uh, the county needs. Um, and it's consistent with our systems change work and where there's, you know, real social venture opportunity. Um, so that's super exciting. And, uh, but, but we're, you know, like all of our work, it's definitely a, a collaborative learning, <laughs> learning. And so we, we're we excited to bring you all along in that journey. Great. Stay why tuned. You, yeah. Why don't you roll into the Climate Resilience Think Lab too? Yeah. So then the other big topic um, that, uh, that we've been exploring um, with the community uh, has been around climate resilience and um, coming out of COVID, in addition to digital uh, divide, um, one of the other topics that was uh, escalated to us as a community foundation was, hey, you know, we've really learned from COVID that um, that it doesn't impact our community equitably. And, you know, we've really seen that. And now we see it tangibly. You know, I can work from home. I can play fetch with my dog. I can get paid a good salary being at home with my kids. But then, hey, what's happening in a lot of our, our, our neighborhood, uh, neighboring communities where folks are living uh, in smaller living situations and, and getting infected, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was a real aha moment for a lot of folks in COVID, which, which perhaps is a silver lining uh, as we think about some of this work. Um, but that, that also made people think about, well, what happens when climate transition occurs? We're seeing climate transition happen. What, what does that mean for us as a county? Um, and are we ready for that? You know, we weren't ready for COVID. 
are we ready for climate resiliency and climate transition? And so we embarked on a, uh, a process to do, uh, just like in digital equity, a study to understand a baseline analysis of how we're doing in a variety of different climate equity and climate resiliency metrics. Um, and we have uh, we've shared some of that data, but we're going to be publishing a report in the next couple of weeks, uh, finalizing that report in the next couple of weeks. And then we also convened about 100 folks. Um, many of you all participated in it in a climate resiliency think lab, which was a visioning process to ask the question, you know, what can we do as a county? What does it look like to be a collaborative uh, Essex County around climate resiliency for all? And, um, and so we are publishing that Think Lab report, which is a bunch of just amazing ideas and actions that came out of that, that we that help inform us to understand better as a community foundation, what our role can be as we think systemically around climate resiliency uh, for all of uh, our residents across our county. And so stay tuned for the Think Lab report and the, uh, the Tufts data report. And uh, we're going to continue to be doing outreach in the community to understand, um, you know, what we can do uh, potentially as a uh, systems approach and a uh, multi-year approach around climate resiliency um, as a county. So that's very exciting also, but we're, we're in the learning phase of that also. If you have any, any questions or comments or thoughts on place-based impact investing or climate resiliency, please reach out to uh, myself or any of us um, and we'll, we'll, we'll help inform you. Thanks, Stratton. Um, and then just the last piece to give a heads up on is um, this year, 2024, is the official anniversary of Essex County Community Foundation um, as a community foundation. So we're celebrating our 25th anniversary birthday. We went with anniversary. Um, and um, you're going to see it's kind of, uh, it'll be a year of storytelling. So our foundation focus that's going out pretty soon. Um, we'll actually have begin with our origin story. So we've interviewed David Torrey, who is one of the co-founders here. And over the course of this year, you will hear more stories about what 25 years has looked like and the impact that we've had in 25 years from grant making, from um, working in, and helping people with their philanthropic efforts by opening funds here. Um, systems change, same thing. Um, and so you'll see these stories roll out. I share that all with you because there will be a culmination at the end of 2024 on November 13th. You should have already received a, a digital version of, hey, save the date, but we'll be sharing and doing it a little bit more forcefully now um, that on November 13th at night at the Danvers Port Yacht Club, we haven't set the time yet, um, Danvers Port in, in Danvers, um, we'll be hosting a 25th anniversary celebration. It will be interactive. It will um, have a lot of cool things going on at it, um, which we won't divulge yet, um, but it will certainly talk about 25 years at the heart of Essex County and what that looks like. So I just wanna make sure that that's on everyone's calendar. Um, you will get formal invitations. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, any other questions that you have for any of us as to what's happening here at the Community Foundation? Um, that we can I'm answer in five to... minutes. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Steve. Well, no, no question, but I wanted to, as a new fund holder at ECCF, I want to thank ECCF, congratulate you and your partner, Sarah, and uh, as a grantee and partner on this amazing work. And I really appreciate the effort put into uh, providing an update. Uh, my only question was on sort of financial leveraging and uh, we heard a lot about that in terms of how the, the state and local funding can step in because you've done a lot of great groundwork. So um, thank you. Steve. And Steve, Steve, it's funny. We, we sort of said two to three times the amount of money that we're going to leverage in addition to the county around digital equity. It's probably greater than that. You know, I, you know, so Kate and I are in the process of calculating all of the different components of that in, uh, and over the, the, the multiple years. Um, which is huge, right? You build a platform, you build this capability, and then people get excited um, to invest or they see like, geez, now I can see how I can invest in that, that community. So that's, that's a big piece of our work. Terrific. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Good to see everybody. You know, thanks for making no time on Friday mornings. You know, um, Sarah, really just a, a giant. I mean, Steve said it already, but we can't thank you enough for joining us today and sharing the story of Hawk and the work that you're doing. We we greatly appreciate you being here. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, everyone.